we have all taken this COVID thing seriously and we take into consideration all the conflicting recommended precautions from the experts because we want to live as long as possible. And that desire to survive is, is part of our God-given nature, that being established. How much concern do we have for eternal matters? Have you ever thought about how advanced you would be in your spiritual journey if the things of God were as ever-present in your daily life as all the information that you're receiving from the world? And the world has a message that they preach. It's an ever-changing message. But there is a message we preach, and it never changes. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8 says, It is the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith. A preacher from my childhood days said, The word will stand when the world is on fire. It just doesn't change. So we all place our faith in something. The word of faith gives us assurance that our never-ending inheritance is being reserved in heaven for you. So we'll look at our text this morning, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible, and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May the hearing of God's word increase our understanding of God's ability to keep that reservation in heaven for those of us who know him by faith. Verse 5 says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Nobody knew better than Peter about this keeping power. He stumbled, he failed the Lord, and he did that more than once. Hard-hearted and set in his religious ways, Peter eventually learned to trust his Savior without reservation. So I want you to notice from our passage that God has a purpose for which he keeps us. Again, verse 5, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. We know from Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by grace through faith. And this faith is a lifetime commitment. His work will not be completed until he calls us home. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in us or in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So when, when Peter speaks of being kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, his purpose is that you might be saved. Salvation, what, what a wonderful word. Salvation. And hopefully you can say with me that I have been saved. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us. This is where salvation begins. It involves a new birth. Christianity is not turning over a new leaf. It is taking on a new life. And that life is referred to as eternal life. Christianity is for whosoever will. 
The born again experience is available to any and all who will call on his name. There must be that initial transformation, a con conversion, if you please. I have been saved. Uh, most of you can say, I think most of you can say, I have been saved. But, but here's a, a question that I want to propose to you. Can you say, I am being saved? You say, well, I don't understand. Well, let me, let me read two passages to you from, from a, a good translation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, if you need to note it. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 2 Corinthians 2.15 For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing, and among those who are perishing. So, you can say, I have been saved, but can you say, I am being saved? Begotten us again, he says, to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The world's message is one of hopelessness. Those born again have a living hope. That living hope is something that continues. It's because of the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 tells us, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. It's vain. You are still in your sins. Apart from the resurrection, we just have no hope. And that's the, way, that's the reason the world has such a hopeless message, because they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But because Jesus is alive, there is a hope that nothing can, can, uh, that not, can, cannot be darkened by the world. So uh, we, we wait. We grow in grace. We are continually in a process of conforming more and more to His image, according to Romans 8, 29. And we watch for that final stage of salvation. So here we find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic. We are continually hearing of death. Barbara just told me of two people she knows that has died. And it's, it's if you do Facebook, which I don't, you're probably hearing every day of somebody that has died from COVID. But let me tell you something. The grave is not a dead end for the Christian. Salvation continues. And I've been saved, and I hope you can say that. That is justification. That means that you have a right standing with God. I am being saved. That's called sanctification. That has to do with my, how I live my life. And because of His grace, I have a continual expectation that I will be saved. And that is referred to as glorification. So while life is preparatory and death is nothing more than a passage, we are kept for eternity. We are looking forward to that, that keeping power for eternity uh, and that salvation is permanent. I have been saved, I'm being saved, I will be saved. Verse 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for who? Reserved in heaven for you. God is keeping us for that day when we will physically be changed. We will live in a body that does not know death. It is the completion of our deliverance from sin, the redemption of our bodies, and our personal presentation before the presence of the Father. It's in verse 5, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So you should be able to say that I have been saved from the penalty of sin. And you should be able to say that I am being saved from the practice of sin. And you should be able to say that I will be saved from the very presence of sin. So we're confident and we can rejoice in this absolute truth. Ephesians 1.11 says, In Him also 
we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his counsel, the counsel of his will. That confidence is addressed in Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It is incorruptible, the Bible says. It is undefiled, and it says it does not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you and me. It is an inheritance incorruptible. It's indestructible. It is undefiled. It's immaculate. It does not fade away. It can't be removed. It is reserved for you and me. It is kept under watch. And no human mind can conceive that God is holding in store what it is that God is holding in store for His children. We are His heirs. Jesus has promised He is preparing a place for His people. It is equally true that He is preparing His people for that prepared place. So we're being kept for a purpose unto a living hope, even heaven itself. But God has the power by which He keeps us. Verse 5, kept by the power of God. We are kept by His power. We are kept in His power. It is, it is as though we are surrounded by some spiritual fortress. Even the weakest person is protected and kept. There's many passages in the Bible that states that the believer is found in Christ. And in Christ we are satisfied. The safest place you can be in 2021. Now I know, I know what the world is telling you, but this is what the Bible is telling you. The safest place you can be found is in Christ. Amen. Paul reminds us in Colossians 3, 3 that our life is hidden with Christ in God. To be hidden in Christ is to be guarded. Now, let, let, me, let me just stop a second. There are three dangers that you need to be very aware of. And none of these are going to be listed in the news. You're not going to see any of these dangers talked about by the government. But the Bible talks about them. There's three particular dangers that you need to be fully aware of. And we are guarded from these dangers. The first is we are guarded from society. Jesus said John, in John 16, 33, the world will, in the world you will have tribulation. But he, he assured us, in me you have peace. When we are as Christian Americans see the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches of our own government aggressively attacking our Christian faith, we find it to be appalling. It's offensive. We are totally surrounded by the new, new, which is un-American, the new normal, as they call it. Even in America, the world is cruel and hostile. It's a hostile place toward followers of Christ. And the sooner that we recognize that the world system is not only unchristian and non-Christian, but it is thoroughly anti-Christian. And when we do that, we take shelter in our Lord Jesus Christ. James is rather blunt in chapter 4 and verse 4 when he says, Do you not know that friendship, the friendship of the world, is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We have a serious conflict. We have a serious enemy. It is the world. It is society around us. So if we're to be preserved in our pilgrimage, we're going to have to learn to abide in Christ. Our days of hiding behind our wonderful constitution is soon going to be over. Our protection is greater than that of the Constitution. It's greater than legalized baby killers. It is, it is greater than the sodomites who hide under the judicial robes of an increasingly Marxist government. We are protected. We are guarded. Jesus prayed in John 17 that we should not be taken out of the world but kept from the world. We can be at peace in the midst of a noisy, fighting, and distracting world. We are guarded from society. 
Now you say, that sounds like a pretty serious enemy. It sounds like a pretty serious advocate, uh, uh, a serious uh, uh, aggressor against us. But there's one that's even worse. You have another enemy that's worse than society. And I hate to break this to you, but, but that enemy is you. Not only are you guarded from society, but you are guarded from self. Romans 8, 8 says, Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. To be in the Spirit is to be in Christ. And Paul tells us in verse 10, If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life. If the world is the external foe, then the flesh is the internal foe. You should be able to identify with Galatians 2.20 in the sense of being crucified with Christ. The triumphant Christian is a person that has crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires, according to Galatians 5.24. To abide in Christ by the power of the indwelling spirit is to know the constant victory over the flesh. So you're in a struggle. You may not be in a struggle with the world as much as you are with yourself. An old preacher that I remember from Williamsburg, Kentucky said he would look in the mirror every morning and say, you rascal. He was looking at his number one enemy. What a wonderful provision God has made against the onslaughts of the flesh. We desire this moment by moment protection from the subtle attacks of the flesh life. We're guarded from society. We're guarded from self. Now here's a real serious enemy that we need to think about. We're also guarded from Satan. Addressing his father in John 17, Jesus said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one, the devil, Satan. He says, as you, Father, and are in me and I in you, they also may be one in us. To be in Christ is to know complete victory over the devil. Colossians 2.15 explains how at Calvary our Lord disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them. Ephesians 2.14 shows how that He also destroyed Him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And I can assure you that this thing that has been unloosed on this planet called COVID is of the devil. Uh, some of you might want to give God the credit for that, but I don't. Uh, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so Romans 8, 37 gives us this result of, of that war on the cross that he won against the devil. It says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, some refuse this wonderful salvation based on their inability to, to be good enough to go to heaven. And surely we ought to believe that the Bible says in the epistle of Jude, He is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. So while it's true that you and your flesh cannot please God, it's absolutely a fact that you can't live a Christian life. There's no question about that. But it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, that makes the difference. God had a purpose for which He keeps us. And God has the power by which He keeps us. And then lastly, I want you to notice from our text that God has a process through which He keeps us. We're talking about being kept by God, protected by Him. Verse 5 of our text who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. God has not devised some complicated means by which we should experience this keeping power. We are kept through faith. Faith is not a work. Faith is simply our response to His provision. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please Him. For each individual, this process begins with a, the gift of saving grace. Faith involves accepting a person 
John 1, 12 tells us, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. You see, until you receive Christ, you're not in Christ. He said, well, I, I believe that Jesus lived and died. And until you receive Christ, you're not in Christ. You say, well, I, I go to church all the time. Until you receive Christ, you are not in Christ. But, you, but I, my, my parents were Christians. My grandpa was a preacher. Until you personally receive Christ, you are not in Christ. And until you are in Christ, you cannot be kept by the power of God. When you take Him as your life, you live. When you take Him as your power, you endure. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. It is the process by which you receive Jesus Christ, the gift of saving grace. There's this growth in saving grace. 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Having been saved by grace through faith, it is incumbent upon me and you to live by that same faith. Growth is certainly a sign of life. As our desire for the things of God increases, Fellowship with the saints increases. Bible study and worship becomes increasingly more important. We're showing signs of growth. If you plant a fruit tree and it never bears any fruit, it's really of no use to you. And if you grow, have a tree and it doesn't have any leaves and it just doesn't show any signs of life, it's dead. So, we, have, we are saved by this wonderful gift of saving grace. And we know that we're saved because we continue to grow. It's a sign of life. Then there's the gratitude for saving grace. The same faith that trusts God for His wonderful salvation is a thankful faith. It's a, it's a faith that, that knows that we never did ever deserve this amazing grace. And never forget the resurrection of, of Christ makes all of this possible. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, in dealing with our Lord's resurrection, says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you're thankful for this wonderful saving grace. Continual exposure to a complaining, unthankful world is going to wear you out. Their attitude of ingratitude is going to rub off on you. And that's not who we are. That's not what we do. We are a people of faith. Our faith is in the finished work of Calvary. It is the kind of faith that allows us to be more than conquerors through Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. And for that we are eternally grateful. If Christ is truly our life and we trust Him moment by moment, then we should be able to thank Him for His keeping power. According to His promise, we're guarded from the world, society. We're guarded from the flesh, self. We are guarded from the devil, Satan, until His final purpose of salvation is gloriously revealed, we are guarded. This is a satisfying, victorious life for all who will accept it. We've seen the purpose for which we're kept, the power in which we are kept, in the process by which we are kept. Now let me ask you this. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what hinders you? What hinders you then from becoming a Christian? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the keeping power that is promised. We are saved by faith. We are kept by faith. And we have faith in the fact that one day we will be gloriously changed to be in the image that you are. Right now we're in the process as believers of being changed, conforming more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. Help us to grow more and more like you. Help us to show signs of life in our everyday life. 
Thank you for these who are here today that know that they are saved. If there's anyone that does not know that, help them to know it this day by simply turning to you by faith and saying, Jesus, I turn from my sins and I trust you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Help someone to do that today. Help us, Lord, as we grow in grace, looking forward to that time when you will change our mortal bodies to be like you in our final stage of salvation, glorification. We're trusting you now in Jesus' name. Amen.